All right. Um, well, our next speaker this morning is Mark Smith. Um, his talk is Microscopic to Macroscopic Photography, Bringing the Small to the World. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, th ben, thank you everybody for participating and joining in on this. I know that the conversion to virtual was, was pretty fast, especially to accommodate um, Black Lives Matter and STEM and everything. It's been pretty amazing. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in because this is probably the sh one of the shorter talks I have to deliver. Um, so I'm Mark Smith. Uh, I, I'm a geologist by, by training and education. Um, I got my master's from UConn in structural geology. But I was also a big hobbyist and enthusiast in just standard um, uh, focus stacking back when it was beginning. And my neighbor was a molecular biologist at the U.S. Army who was trying to digitize uh, vectors, problematic vectors like ticks and mosquitoes. Uh, and <clears throat> I was able to go to his lab. We were able to work on a system which had then been patented. And then what we tried to do was commercialize it after I graduated. So a lot of this is gonna have a geoscientific spin, but also a great spin on the work we do with museums. So at the time, um, what we were dealing with were four primary uh, imaging platforms, SEM and TEM, which are very good at getting very small structures, confocal uh, on a similar uh, light, and then compound microscopy and stereo microscopy. Um, what we were trying to do is really figure out what the limitations of these systems were and, and improve upon it. And Automontage was already doing that. It's a Leica system where in 2006 through 2010 was really a go-to system for focus stacking. But the optics were not necessarily paired perfectly with the resolution in the camera sensors. And not only that, but the cost was not conducive for standard use. I mean, these systems were over 100K, uh, and that was over a decade ago. So they were, they, were not, um, they were not easily accessible by any means. So what we wanted to do was take that hobby background that we had in focus stacking with these, these home pill platforms, this was actually the first prototype, and try to merge the best of optics and the best of resolution directly with the best cameras on the market. So initially when we built this, I was uh, doing my undergrad and a researcher clued in onto my undergraduate research project, which focused on this. And he was a molecular biologist also, and we were looking at Rhizoactinia solani, so barrage line development, how one uh, virus can kill a, a second virus after it has been mutated. Uh, and this is really for uh, defense type systems. It was sponsored by DARPA to protect rice and potato crops. And like I said, uh, the system initially was built um, in collaboration with the US Department of Health and the Walter Reed Institute. So a huge, huge emphasis on, on small size vectors. We're talking a millimeter uh, and smaller. And then what we, we try to do later is really improve upon our magnification capabilities. So the limitations of those conventional imaging systems really revolved around depth of field and a capable platform of capturing color. And what we wanted to do was, was merge those two, but not through the process of producing a large stereo photograph. We wanna take one final image so that the data is manageable uh, and also have it be very, very high in quality uh, for a wide, wide range of users. And what we really wanted to do was build a portable platform, one that was small, but really took the best of the components, a stable platform that could accommodate uh, a wide range of materials, everything from wet, dry, uh, pin, slide mounted. So we're all familiar with focus stacking. Uh, per the rules, I'm not gonna play this video, but really it's a focus stack through this flies, um, well, they played anyways, <laughs> uh, but that is, um, this is the final result. It's a, it's a focus stack merged of 200 photographs. And if you notice, one thing we try to do is focus no glare. Uh, any, any common artifacts in photography, we try to eliminate entirely. And when we first built the system and commercialized it in 2013, our limitation was around 100 microns of detail. But we were already shooting slides, and we were already shooting very difficult materials like ambers or, or other materials that were in alcohol. So the next phase, in 2015 was then to create our micro kit, which allows us to, to capture high magnification data. And this gets us all the way down to two to four microns in size. So this is a very tiny parasitoid per wasp. And then you can see the actual cell structure, very comparable to an SEM, but again, non-destructive portable system in color uh, and, and image capture time in under three minutes for something this small, which is, which is very quick when you're half a millimeter or less. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was integrate 3D modeling techniques. So this is actually a 3D model, very small rodent tooth. You can see it in comparison with the dam or the, the dime there. 
Uh, and not only that, but also be able to, it's a lot easier to 3D model something larger than it is smaller, but we wanted to build a platform that, that could do it all. Uh, and then we, we go to a lot of conferences and because my wife is a biologist and I'm a geologist, we, we sit and we listen and try to build niche systems for specific problems that, that researchers and curators are having. So after that, we then switched to a petrographic analyzer, which allows you to cross polarize slides and materials, but does away with the expensive and limited petrographic microscope. Uh, it allows you to use a standard DSLR, and that same platform is also being used by many of our clients to image other slides like Lepidoptera genitalia and so forth. And again, it, it, this is just an example of, of how it's digitizing uh, rocks and minerals in thin section. We then broke into UV light and fluorescent light capabilities, uh, very low cost. We've been able to integrate and 3D print many, many optical filters that basically um, adapt directly onto existing flashes. So now you can take the same system and start to utilize ultraviolet and fluorescent light. Uh, so th these are some examples of a GFP stained mouse embryo and actually looking at the torus structure of blood cells and just a, a ruby under fluorescent and, and reflected light microscopy. And again, uh, we also, uh, we're working with a variety of geoscientists, so we also build these automated platforms that focus on digitizing core samples, so uh, sedimentary, lacustrine sediments, uh, and, and other heavy-duty rock core samples. Uh, and then we also broke out and started building a system that could focus on tree core. So this is an entire sample of core and images, not just the rings, but also the cell wall thickness between those rings. We also work with a lot of people to deliver these custom systems uh, as well. So for fast, rapid slide imaging and so forth. And what I really want to talk about are some of the workflows we've been creating with our groups. So early on, some of our clients at the Smithsonian and USDA, Matt Buffington, Lourdes, um, Jim Woolley, uh, we sat down and started building workflows that were specifically tailored to them. They're looking at parasitoids that are a half a millimeter or smaller but at the, you know, in the same light, a couple of weeks ago, they were digitizing the large murder wasp. Um, so what we're trying to do is be able to build a platform and a workflow that, that not only helps them with their image capture process, but also the way that they interpret label information and database so that it's standardized across the Hymenoptera platform. And likewise, we've done the same thing. Uh, Jennifer Zaspel contacted me a few years ago and she was putting out this terrestrial parasite tracker uh, grant, which is getting together museum curators for parasite tracking. Uh, and again, we focused on a working group. This is us at the Chicago Field Museum. And we were trying to build a workflow. Uh, and what's so unique about this workflow is it was initially started to be put together by Alyssa Kaywood and, and um, she did a great job. And then what we did is we sat down and went through and tailored a lot of it. And what it does is everything from uh, capturing the label data how to interpret the label data and standardize it across multiple uh, platforms such as GBIF and Globy. And then um, we also have different workflows over here. So for slides, pins, alcohol, wet specimens, but not just tailored for high quality images of type specimens or for evolutionary work, but we also have tables and workflows that are specifically designed for high throughput. So if you're not so focused on high quality, uh, we can bring down and increase the speed quite rapidly. So in the end, what we tried to do is produce a portable system, really one that you could use in the field, but turned out being very useful for people traveling to museums to image type specimens. But also as a, as a geologist, what we tried to do is have it so that now you can take your DEM, georeference and satellite data, and then photograph your field location, the samples from that field location, and then all of the materials, uh, other different types of analytical techniques. So really, have one tool that allows you to digitize everything. And I have one minute left. So what I wanted to do is just speak to some of the things and ways that we work with other researchers that museums uh, have exhibits to try and push this out. This was an exhibit which is called, um, it's the micro forest. It's mosses and lichens enlarged to 12 feet panels that's gonna be installed at the, at the University of Connecticut Natural History Museum and also down in Patagonia where the samples are from. This was another example uh, where we were working with an actual artist, uh, Fiona Partington, where she featured uh, Vladimir Nabokov's work with his, his uh, blue morph butterflies. Uh, and we traveled to different natural history museums to digitize his particular uh, materials. And then these are just exhibits where we were demonstrating the symbiotic, the complex symbiotic nature of these people's specific research studies. So here, this is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. 
Um, this is an ant that produces its own antibacterial fungi, fung, uh, own antibacteria medicine to actually treat fungus. And then another panel to describe how plants have sex and then tapeworms. And, um, and then we also did a, a paleobotany, one that uh, what this does is it actually takes fossilized leaves and they're, they're, they're looking at the stomata, stomatal counts to reconstruct what um, the CO2 conditions were in the paleo atmosphere. So with that, I think just a little over 10 minutes, but that, that is a, a fast version of my presentation. And I, again, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for having me today. I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Mark. We do have one question so far in the Q&A. Christina asks, can you explain more about the petrographic analyzer? Sure, so what we did, uh, it functions the exact same way as a petrographic microscope, except what, we do, what we've done is we've taken a UV filter and a polarizer and we mounted that on a platform. This is all on our website too. And if you go to the um, Meet Our Clients tab, you can actually see other researchers that are using that to case studies. But what, what it's doing is it actually shines light down onto a white matte base and then re, that reprojects light back up. So, and that goes through the bottom polarizer and then through the, the uh, slide and then through a secondary polarizer that's mounted on the lens. So that allows you to measure pleochroism. You can rotate it 360 degrees, but also where a petrographic microscope has a lot of bright hot spots that come up through the crystalline matrix, because we reflect light off of a matte base we virtually eliminate that. So you're actually getting images from the top and the bottom. You're illuminating it. And it's a totally uh, matte image with no glare. So it's also very good in terms of getting great image clarity. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Allison asks, you mentioned filters for imaging fluorescent specimens and making that part of the system. Could you elaborate on how you find or create those filters? Yeah, so uh, it's through part, actually partnerships like this. So initially, uh, Charlie Mazel, he's with Nightsea. He's a vendor at ESA, most commonly, um, and he's in Massachusetts, we're in Connecticut. So uh, what he does is he makes the glass for these things and then, and then buys yellow filters from Tiffin, which are just standard off-the-shelf filters. But the blue glass filters, he cuts them down to size and then sells them to manufacturers like us that then try to integrate them with whatever our lighting methods are. So we make adapters specifically for the Canon flashes, but we can make them for other flashes as well. And I, I should emphasize that the workflows that I'm talking about, while they do tailor to the system and platform that we make, uh, they're not limited to it. You can also apply these to the other imaging systems you have, likewise with the fluorescent filters. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Christina. Could you expand more on 3D modeling small mammal teeth? Oh, yeah. So um, that was uh, mammal tooth or a small rodent tooth was actually the very first subject that we tested. So um, basically, it's mounted to a pinhead. And we have an automated rotary stage and an aluminum micro gimbal that allows you to rotate your material. Uh, we also have it so you can mount it in one axis and rotate it almost so that it's a bit oblique. And that way you don't even need to capture multiple axes. You can just do one round of images in 10 degree increments uh, and pair it with the either like a 7.5 or a 10 um, X objective, which we have. Uh, that, that's a perfect scale for, for small mammal teeth. And then what we use uh, with our product also comes licenses to Agisoft Metashape now it's called, it used to be uh, Photoscan. And that is the tool that allows you to, to take the data from, from our images and then, inter and then uh, basically produce a 3D model. But because of our significant glare reduction, it's a lot easier to build a model now than it was before because there isn't as many uh, imaging artifacts that sort of corrupt the, the file to build a 3D model. Great. Um, aha, Lauren Smith from the Field Museum asks, um, well, first they comment that the images are beautiful. Um, do you have workflows for historic slide mounted material that may be damaged? For example, slides where cracks or bubbles exist or the medium has changed color? Um, it's not a specific workflow, but I did certainly have uh, certain tips and strategies we have. I would liken that to something like amber. Um, there are ways where you can mess with the refractive index uh, through a certain medium. So I would actually recommend maybe submerging them if you're able to, but if you're not and that's destructive, there are other ways. Um, 
but I, I would have to sit down. You are happy to contact me and send me a few samples and we can work on something where I can just test it and see if there's anything I can put together to help you. Uh, I do that for stuff all the time. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, aha. Have you studied the property of pliochroism by petrographic microscope? Uh, I wouldn't say I studied the particular field. Um, so from my undergraduate research, what I had to do was look at an earthquake zone through Taiwan, and we looked at examples of cataclysis. So, so rock that's, that's very broken from earthquakes, and we had to reconstruct where the stresses were in the earth. And for that, pleochroism is important, and, but it's more important for mineral identification uh, or fluid inclusion, like the petroleum industry. And what happens is when you rotate a slide, it'll go, the minerals will go extinct at certain angles, and that helps identify uh, the exact mineral that you're focused on or looking at. So that is usually how pleochroism is studied. Um, there are two handbooks that I use as resources, and it's been a while <laughs> since undergrad, but I do have those uh, books, and I can't remember what they are offhand, but what I can do is I can go in the other room, look at them, and I can uh, write them in the comment section. Mm, all right, so we have a few clarification questions. Um, so Martin asks, um, could you repeat the name of the museum that will have the microscopic forest exhibit? The micro, oh, oh yeah, so that's, uh, that's the University of Connecticut Natural History Museum. My wife's a uh, adult faculty there and I'm a grad. It's right down the road. And it's also going to be, an, it was installed at the embassy, the Chilean embassy in um, Washington, D.C. And it's also going to be installed later on at a new museum that's being built in, or it's either new or existing, kind of going through secondary information here, but this is in um, Patagonia. So it's going to be installed at three different places, but it's going to be built as a traveling exhibit, so it can go other places as well. Okay, cool. Um, there are a couple more clarification questions, um, but they're more like looking at links, so I'll leave that to you later. Uh, okay. We have just one more question um, for your presentation. Uh, Magnesia asks, uh, has your petrographic setup been used for visualizing fossil insects? Um, so it can be used. You can place an amber on top of it. Um, what you really want to try to do is, is uh, look at more reflective light for that type of material. Um, the, I guess the short answer real quick is, is, is no. Um, we usually use other methods to look and examine that type of material. I'll leave it at that. All right, great, thank you. Um, perfect, so if you would um, direct your attention to those links in the Q&A, um, you can see them, oh. correct? Cool. Yep, uh, yeah. I'll leave those up to you and I'll get the next presentation ready and we'll start back up at 1210. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark.